Hey guys, we're Allie and Gary with Roll With Us DMs, professional game masters with over 17 years of experience that also love to go on some side quests with our friends, which you can see here on our channel. Thank you for checking out our videos. If you haven't already, you should quest down to the subscription button and strike the notification bell so you never miss our content. Our links are in the description below. Consider becoming a channel member to access epic perks, including playing in one of our games. Now, on with the video! <laughs> and welcome back to part two of my short rest as I talk about the classes in DC20. Kind of a first look, first impressions of these classes. Today we're going to start with the monk. I have built a monk, I have seen a monk played, and the monk seemed very flavorful in comparison to its 5th uh, edition uh, counterpart, and I think it takes the names and mechanics from 5th edition monk and combines it with the elegance of the way that Pathfinder 2nd Edition handled their monk. And I think when you see this, it will come together as a full package. So, um, monks being a martial class have stamina. They regain that stamina when they do things that you would expect a monk to do. In this case, once per round, when you hit a target with an unarmed uh, strike, uh, you regain a stamina, you don't regain it if you spent stamina on the attack. So you can't use your stamina to fuel an endless loop of stamina, but monks want to hit with unarmed strikes, and uh, this is going to be a very easy way for the monk to regain the stamina and fuel their maneuvers and other abilities. And once per turn when an attack misses you. As a monk, you're kind of dodgy, and this feeds that flavor, that fantasy of a monk being able to dodge out of the way, and when they do, they recover their stamina. Next up, <clears throat> quintessential ability of the monk, Flurry of Blows. Uh, the damage of unarmed strikes increases by one, and your Attacks, attack checks made as part of an unarmed strike ignore the multiple check penalty up to four attacks. The way that this feature works is two parts. Number one, normally an unarmed strike only deals one damage. This is going to increase that to two, putting the monk on par with other marshals who are swinging weapons usually for two or three damage, but you're only going to get two. However, uh, looking at the back end of this ability, your attack checks made as part of an unarmed strike. Ignore the multiple attack, multiple check penalty, up to four attacks. So, what this lets... The reason that this is so powerful is when you look at the system and its rules, and then what this ability lets you do, uh, you realize the power of it. So normally... Uh, again, to reiterate, your first attack would be a d20 plus your modifier. Your second attack is at disadvantage, rolling 2d20 and taking the lowest, a plus your modifier, of course, all of these. Uh, your third attack would be at double disadvantage, roll 3d20 and take the lowest. And your fourth attack would be at triple disadvantage, roll 4d20s, take the lowest. The monk completely ignores this as long as they're making unarmed strikes. And the fact that they are more accurate with their unarmed strikes than anybody else's with their normal attacks lets them strike as many times in a round as they want with their unarmed strikes, as accurate as the first attack that anybody else gets normally. Combined with increasing the damage by one, and you have a pretty potent flurry of blows. One interesting caveat to this is that uh, in the example here, you can make four attack checks with your unarmed strikes without disadvantage, or you could make one attack check with a weapon and then three attack checks unarmed 
uh, without disadvantage. So if you were a weapon-wielding monk, you could still swing that two-handed weapon for three damage and then make the rest of your attacks unarmed strikes um, for two damage each. And again, the monk just very solid here, uh, the way that it works within the system. And the other thing that I really love about this is, <clears throat> excuse me, in comparison to how Flurry of Blows works in both 5th edition and Pathfinder 2nd edition. So let me talk first on the 5th edition version is a bonus action. You spend a key point, you can make two unarmed strikes. Within the 5th edition system, that's fine. Um, spending the key point makes it um, a very limited ability. You do have the martial arts for the monk in 5th edition where as a bonus action you can make an unarmed strike if you take the attack action. So you can get extra attacks as a monk in 5th edition, uh, but it's always the same unless you use flurry of blows and then you get that extra, you get two attacks with your bonus action. In Pathfinder 2nd edition, you don't have key for flurry of blows. You can do it every turn. It's one action, make two attacks. The attacks incur multiple attack penalty uh, normally so that your first unarmed strike is gonna be at um, regular bonus and your second as part of flurry of blows is gonna be most likely at minus four and then you combine the damage to overcome resistance. So it's not to say that Flurry of Blows isn't strong in Pathfinder. Uh, also, the fact that there aren't as many opportunity attacks uh, allows the monk to, say, move up to their speed, make two attacks, and then still have an action to do something else. So it is strong in the system, and it still does allow that flexibility. So it is a good feature in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. But what I love about this Flurry of Blows is how flexible and customizable it is. If you want to make one attack, fine, you make one attack. If you want to like make two attacks, you got two attacks. If you want to go all in, make three, you can make three attacks. And if you were in melee already and didn't have to move, you wanted to just go all in on four attacks, you could just like fulfill that fantasy of pop, 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 as you're like just uh, punching away. So I think this Flurry of Blows is really cool. And then the next thing that the monk gets is this uh, Patient Defense. So coming from 5th edition, there is an ability called Patient Defense. It is a bonus action and takes one key point normally in 5th edition and it allows you to take uh, the dodge action as a bonus action. This is a very good ability, and it's actually often underrated, I feel. I underrated it myself until I started realizing its power, that you could move, attack, and then still dodge as a bonus action. But I think DC20 nails it here in making uh, an ability called Patient Defense and making it about your defense. So this is where the monk gets their unarmored defense, their patient mental defense, which gives them a usually higher than normal uh, mental defense because they get to add their combat mastery to their mental defense, where most people do not. And they also, oh, I'm sorry, not their combat mastery, they get to add their prime ability to their mental defense, where most do not. And then patient physical defense, again, allowing them to add their prime ability. So essentially gaining at first level a plus three to their mental defense and their physical defense. And from what I've seen, the monk that I built had the highest defense out of any character that I've seen played or uh, created. So this is very good. That would be good if that was all that the monk got at level one. But the monk also gets Step of the Wind, which is another name that a 5th edition player would be used to, familiar with. Except this is way more powerful and flavorful than the 5th edition version. So the 5th edition version, just to uh, reiterate, is one key point, a bonus action, 
you can uh, dodge, I mean, sorry, disengage or dash. And if you dash, your jump distance is doubled for that turn. Um, again, requiring key makes it a limited use. And uh, this just gives you pretty much everything that you would think that a monk would have with an ability called Step of the Wind because you are getting, while unarmored, increasing your speed and your jump distance, being able to move a number of spaces equal to your jump distance along vertical surfaces and across liquids without falling during your move, which for anybody that's watched my other videos and I gushed on a monk, um, this is a, I believe, a ninth level feature for monks in 5th edition, and you're getting it here at 1st edition. A 1st edition, a 1st, sorry, a 1st level monk in DC 20 can run up a wall, can run across the liquid surface. This is super cool. Also, you can use your prime ability to, instead of agility to determine your jump distance. If you remember from my previous video, I was talking about the Barbarian and how they could use their uh, Prime for um, uh, their jump distance instead of Agility, or actually they could use Might instead of Agility. I believe it was Might. Anyway, um, this is going to also help the Monk to be good whether you have a good Agility or not. Again, as if that was not enough. And I can't go over them all. But at first level, the monk also gets stances. So similar to the Pathfinder 2nd Edition stances, these allow the monk to do different things. And super cool that they get them, super flavorful. You could picture this monk entering a stance, moving, bobbing in a certain way, making certain kind of attacks, getting certain advantages, and then shifting into another stance uh, what's really cool here is that entering or exiting a stance, minor action. So in DC 20, you have four action points for your turn. But you also get currently at alpha 0 0.6, two minor actions per turn. Minor actions being pretty much your, if you're familiar with 5th edition, it's your free interact with object type stuff like drawing a weapon, opening a door, drawing a potion, that kind of thing. But instead of only having one free interaction with an object per turn, in DC 20, currently you have two, and you can use this to enter your stances. So you're not spending an action to enter a stance, which is a big advantage over Pathfinder 2nd Edition where you do need to spend an action to enter a stance. Uh, just to highlight a couple of them, I'll highlight bear stance, is uh, you get plus one to damage when you score a heavy, brutal, brutal or critical hit with an unarmed strike. Uh, to reiterate, heavy strikes are five over an armor class, brutal strikes are 10 over an armor class, and critical hits are uh, 20 on the die. So you're pretty likely to get the heavy hits probably. It's not too difficult. Brutal hits a little bit less often. What this is gonna do is you already have plus one to your damage from your unarmed strikes with flurry of blows. Bear stance is going to ensure that almost, I would say like 75% of the time or so, you're probably going to get three damage on these heavy hits. And then when you miss an attack with an unarmed strike, you gain advantage on the next unarmed strike you make before the end of your turn. Keeping in mind the fact that the monk doesn't have this stacking disadvantage like the other characters, and bear stance is then actually granting you free advantage if you miss it, if you happen to miss an attack. Very solid, very solid. Um, in fact, I need to get onto the other classes, so I'm not going to go too much more into that. Uh, I'm not going to look too much at the second level features because I feel like I've spent far too long on the monk as it is. But you do eventually get key points. I haven't really looked too much into the key. Um, I'm just going to actually uh, move on to the next class.
But I just say that at level one, the monk is definitely solid. <clears throat> um, paladin. I am actually going to skip over the Paladin. And the reason is that the Paladin is going to be leaving the game. Uh, it, I believe is still in the game as of Alpha 0.6.1. But it is going to be replaced with a Spellblade. Which I think is going to fuel a couple of fantasy options. Dungeon Coach has described it as the quintessential hybrid martial caster and he felt that there were some issues with the way the paladin performed currently so I am just gonna skip the paladin for now the spellblade is not spoiled yet so unfortunately I can't speak much to that but I believe that the spellblade is going to allow customization into Fulfilling that fantasy of a paladin, but also a magus or uh, some other gish fantasy that you might have. Completely up front, the scion. This is going to be a complete um, first impression. I've not looked at the scion at all. Uh, I see it as a spell caster, so they are not going to have stamina. Uh, so let's take a look at at least the first level of the class together. We have Mind Blast. You can spend one action point to physically assault a creature's mind within 10 spaces, so 50 feet. Make a spell check against the mind mental defense of a target within range. On a hit, the target takes one psychic damage. Okay, so what I can say about this is it's pretty much cantrip damage. Except it's not costing you uh, mana, which cantrips typically don't. Uh, although it looks like we have some action point enhancements, so this might be a complete um, cantrip as far as function. Uh, another thing that I could say is the range is similar to cantrip, 10 spaces. And the spell check is against mental defense which is typically lower for most characters. So this is uh, a pretty solid ability just for targeting mental defense. And the target takes one psychic damage. Let's see what we can do to enhance it. Damage, we can spend an action point and deal an extra damage. So if we spend two action points on this Mind Blast, we then deal two damage. Pretty solid. And again, another thing to keep in mind is we're targeting mental defense. By targeting mental defense, this means we're probably not only going to hit them, but heavy hit or brutal hit them by beating their armor class, their mental defense by five or even ten. Let's say we get that brutal hit, and then that's beating their armor class, their mental defense by ten. We are effectively dealing two extra damage: one for the heavy, one for the brutal. One damage for the spell and one damage for this extra action point. Uh, effectively, four damage for two action points. That seems pretty solid to me. Uh, increase the range by five spaces. This is pretty typical of cantrips. And choosing any of the following AP enhancement options uh, forces the target to make a mental save against the chosen effect. Uh, it only makes one effect against all the saves. Ooh, so you can add Daze, uh, where the target becomes dazed. Nice, nice. Uh, break Focus uh, loses their concentration. That's solid. Uh, concentration working just like 5th edition. If a spell requires concentration, uh, it lasts for the duration unless your concentration is broken. Usually it's going to be broken by taking damage, and then you would have to... Uh, in this game, make a mental save versus uh, in 5th edition where you would make a constitution save. Uh, but this is essentially, for one action point, you can just make them lose their concentration. That's very solid. Ren Mine, one action point. The target's mental defense is reduced by two until the end of your next turn. Makes it even easier to hit them with this ability and forceful 
The target has disadvantage on their mental save against this feature. Wow. Wow. And again, I just have to highlight, like, one of the best things with DC20 is the fact that it's so flexible. You have four action points. Spend them however you want. And I think this is one area where DC20 shines over Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Because while Pathfinder 2nd Edition has a three-point action economy, it very rarely allows you to so elegantly spend extra, a extra actions on things. There's a couple spells like Heal, where you can in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, for one action, heal, let's say, a D8 at touch range, where you have to be adjacent to the target, or for two actions, you can heal a D8 plus 8 at a range of 30 feet, or a three action version where you can uh, heal uh, a D8 in a 30 foot radius around you, and then a damage undead if they're within that area. But that's only three options, and it's this, this, or this. This is completely like pick and choose whatever you want. Every time you cast or use this uh, Ren Mind, this Mind Blast, I mean, every time you use it, it could be different. You can empower it however you want. I could see a case where you spend an action point to add the extra damage. You spend an action point to make them lose their uh, concentration. Spend an action point to make them uh, mind, em, mind defense reduced by two until the start, uh, end of their next turn. Uh, and then uh, forceful where they have disadvantage on that save. Or even, let's, uh, let's actually back out this break concentration. This is solid, this is really good. But if you did forceful, where it's disadvantage on this save, right? And you do red mine. And you do Okay, I'm sorry. I got this I got a little twist in what I was coming up with here. You use the ability, you do the extra psychic damage. And you do red mine, and then you give yourself advantage. So you have advantage on this. You're probably going to hit. You're probably going to heavy or brutal hit because their mind defense is probably lower. And then their mind defense is reduced by two until the end of your next turn. So on your next turn, if you were to hit them with this a second time, you could give them disadvantage on their save against this feature and apply another another condition and they're already at minus two so it's going to be even easier to hit heavy hit cr uh, brutal hit you might even go 15 over their mental defense depending on how high you roll anyway solid ability um moving on to the next thing mana point enhancements so you can spend one or more mana points uh, to choose two additional AP enhancements per mana spent. Okay, so is that... Oh, okay. Alright. So this is actually really cool too, because normally you would have to spend action points to enhance this spell. But what this is saying is you could spend one of your mana points to choose two additional action point enhancements per mana spent to this um, Mind Blast ability. So if you really wanted to go all in, you could spend one mana, the maximum that you could at levels one and two, and you could essentially get five of these abilities or even four of these abilities and advantage on the, on the attack. Uh, very solid, very solid. And I mean, even if you didn't have the actions left, let's say you only had one action left, you could still cast this, spend a mana, and add two abilities with that last action. That is so much flexibility. And again, one of the things that I just absolutely love with DC20. Uh, telekinesis, uh, telekinesis is another 
Uh, first level ability. Uh, we have limited telekinesis. You're able to use your mind to easily move objects around you. When you take the object action, you can interact with objects up to five pounds. That is within five spaces of you, so 25 feet. And you can manipulate objects, open doors, and containers. So, kind of mage hand. Uh, pretty cool, though. Pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Combat telekinesis. Uh, you gain access to the grapple maneuvers. So, normally, as a spellcaster, you would not have access to maneuvers. This is giving you access to the grapple maneuvers. And I kind of know where this is going. But when you make a check as part of the shove action, grapple action, grapple maneuver, escape a grapple, you can make a spell check instead. Beautiful, because normally these actions would take your athletics. You're able to do it with a spell check, which is going to use your prime modifier, which means you're going to be good at it, regardless of however you placed your stats. Another beautiful thing with DC 20. And when you do so, uh, use the following changes. So, as if that wasn't good enough, your size is considered medium for the purposes of this check. Again, not penalizing you for being small. Very cool. Uh, you could target creatures within five spaces. Uh, again, normally you could only grapple and do these maneuvers uh, with a creature that's in melee, so very cool. Grapple action while grappling a creature you can choose to move normally, but the target doesn't move with you. You can grapple up to two creatures in this way at a time. So, again, pretty cool because normally if you had somebody grappled and you were moving, you would have to drag them along, and dragging them along makes it cost two squares of act, uh, movement for each one square that you move. But this removes that penalty and allows you to essentially keep them wherever they are if you wanted to. Uh, shove action, you can shove a creature in any direction of your choice. Normally you would only shove in a specific direction, so very cool. Throw maneuver, you can use your prime modifier instead of might to determine a distance thrown. Another, again, beautiful callback to that ability, prime modifier that DC20 uses that allows you to be an effective adventurer regardless of whatever your Whatever your character fantasy is, whatever your stats are, it doesn't matter in DC20. You will be good at the class, at the thing that you want to be good at. And beautiful. Body block maneuver. The target must be within one space of you. Uh, let's see. So for an extra action point, you can... Uh, push, you move them an additional space, or rent body, you reduce their physical defense by two until the end of your next turn. So pretty solid, because if you use this action point enhancement, you can make it easier for your allies to hit. And again, keeping in mind that DC 20 uses five better than an armor class, or than a physical defense in this case. Uh, it's going to be not only easier for your allies to hit the target of this Ren body, but you're also going to make it easier for them to perform heavy and brutal hits. Very cool. And look at this. You can spend one or more mana points to enhance this. So if you only had like one action left, you could spend your mana to fuel this ability. Just more flexibility. Uh, very cool. Uh, I feel like I spent a lot of time on the Scion, so I'm not going to look at uh, level 2. Um, but I could definitely say that level 1 seems pretty solid. Uh, let's look at the Ranger. So Ranger is a martial class. They have stamina. They regain their stamina when they do the things that you would expect Rangers to do. Like take the search action and successfully locate a hidden creature. They succeeded a knowledge check to recall information about a creature, which, speaking of, is another thing that DC20 has taken from Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and I can't say necessarily improved upon it, but the fact that skills do matter in combat and you can do things like recall knowledge is uh, very cool. And when the ranger succeeds, they get their stamina back, so very cool. And once per round, when you hit the target of your Hunter's Mark with a uh, martial attack. So not a spell, but if you hit them with a weapon attack or an unarmed strike, 
uh, you regain your stamina. Uh, also, when the target of your hunter's mark reduces is reduced to zero hit points or dies. So you want to hunt, you want to mark creatures with your hunter's mark, and you want to kill them. So by doing either of those things, you will you will regain your stamina. So be a ranger, get your stamina back. It's uh, helpful to encourage you to fulfill the play style of the class that you have. <laughs> All right, so we got Hunter's Mark. Um, it's one action point and one stamina point to mark something. Uh, 15 spaces is a lot. It's uh, 75 spaces or 75 feet. Uh, I have advantage on awareness and survival checks to find a target. Advantage on the first attack you make against the target each turn. And when you score a heavy or critical hit against the target, they automatically grant a D8 help dice to the next attack made against the target before the end of your next turn. So, Hunter's Mark. I feel like I should talk about the 5e version of Hunter's Mark and the uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition version of what would be considered Hunter's Mark, which is uh, making something your hunted prey. In 5th Edition, Hunter's Mark is a spell. It's a first level spell. Rangers don't have a lot of spell slots. It grants an extra d6 on the damage. And uh, it's concentration and you can move it when you're Hunted prey, when your mark dies, you can transfer it to another creature as a bonus action. Uh, the initial casting of Hunter's Mark is a bonus action. It is bare bones and kind of gives you that flavor of hunting, but I think the limitations of it being a spell... Uh, and just the way that it works is not nearly as clean as this. And then we have the Pathfinder 2nd Edition version, which is use an action to um, mark something as your hunted prey. And then uh, you gain bonuses to attacking them. Uh, depending on what your feat selections are and what kind of ranger you are, you might deal extra damage to them. You might be able to make attacks at uh, less of a penalty like extra attacks. Now to look at this in comparison. So the Pathfinder 2nd Edition version is an unlimited use. This is an unlimited use. As long as you have the stamina and the action to uh, fuel it, you're good. Um, now what does it do for you though? Advantage to track them. That is similar to what you get out of uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Advantage on the first attack you make against the target each turn. Very good. That's very good. Uh, so you're going to have advantage on that first attack. Second attack would be at disadvantage. You could, of course, spend a third action to grant yourself advantage and remove that disadvantage, making for three actions an attack at advantage and an attack at normal. Or you could spend all four actions. The first to make an attack at advantage. The second to attack give yourself advantage with the third, give yourself double advantage with the fourth, that washes out the disadvantage of the second attack and still leaves one instance of advantage, thereby letting you make two attacks at advantage at your hunted prey, at the target of your hunter's mark. Very cool. And again, DC 20 and the way that it grants you that flexibility to play the way that you want to play pick and choose what abilities work when uh, is just uh, a beautiful concept in the, in the system. And um, if you score a heavy or a critical hit, so five over the armor class or uh, 20 on the die, so both very... Uh, I mean, at least getting the heavy is not hard, and then it adds that extra to the critical, but you grant a D8 help die to the next attack made against the target. Also flavorful, you're like wounding the enemy and making it easier for the next person to damage them. 
Uh, Favorite Terrain is going to give you different abilities. In 5th edition, there is um, Favorite Terrain, but you only get, I believe it's one terrain. This is actually giving you uh, two types of environments. And I have to say that like what you get is not necessarily tied to that uh, area. You're though getting some really powerful abilities that help you to fulfill that ranger, that specialized ranger that you are trying to build. Uh, I can't really look at them all because there seems to be a lot here, but like if you pick coast, you're going to gain... Um, if you pick coast, you're going to gain a swim speed equal to your speed. And weapon attacks no longer have disadvantage as a result of being underwater. So just like in 5th uh, edition, if you are underwater, your attacks have disadvantage. If they're not specific weapon types, or if you have a swim speed, this is going to give you that. And you can hold your breath twice as long as normal. Have advantage on awareness checks while underwater. So if you wanted that underwater character... This is a good way to do that. Um, I can't really say like which of these are like strongest, but they all seem pretty solid. Like just just a quick look here. Jungle, you ignore difficult terrain and gain advantage on saves against being poisoned and contracting diseases because jungles are difficult terrain typically and they have poisonous uh, creatures and diseases and you have advantage against them. Uh, let's see. Grasslands, your speed and jump distance increase by one. Flatland, you're probably running a lot so you have that increase to speed, increase to jump. Uh, very, very good flavor there. Let's look at one more. Uh, forest, you gain one skill point in two of the following skills. So you get to add a skill point to Awareness, Survival, or Stealth. If you're in a forest, you're probably using those to move through while perceiving what's going on with Awareness, with Survival to survive in the forest, or Stealth to sneak around through the forest. So again, very, uh, very flavorful. The next thing for... Um, uh, Ranger is level 2. I feel like I've spent too long on Ranger, so I'm going to move on to the next class. But I just say that Natural Hunter sounds similar to something that you get in 5th edition. We have names like Export, Expert Forager, Expert Tracker, uh, Beast Insight, and Hunter Strike. Uh, yeah. You can spend your stamina to deal extra stuff with your weapons. Uh, flavorful. Uh, rogue. I have uh, run for a rogue. And rogues are marshals. Um, they regain a stamina when they hit a flanked target or one that's affected by a condition. Uh, which is what a rogue wants to do. They want to hit creatures that are flanked. Or they want to hit creatures that are hindered in some way so very cool uh, cunning action again a second level feature in fifth edition lets you take uh, dash disengage or hide as a bonus action since DC 20 doesn't use bonus actions everything is actions uh, this is very solid because you can take the disengage action using a minor action. Now keeping in mind that disengage in DC 20, not as strong as in 5th edition, it imposes disadvantage on opportunity attacks. If you wanted the advantage of full disengage, which is the 5th edition version, it would take two actions normally. It's not really spelled out here, but I would assume that the rogue can spend a minor action on disengage and then one action on full disengage, gaining the full disengage for one action. And honestly, I would that's how I would rule it. For example, goblins have nimble escape. 
In 5th edition, it lets them disengage or hide as a bonus action. For DC 20, I just, instead of giving them this cunning action, minor action, disengage, I just gave them a single action, uh, full disengage. So I would, I would rule that cunning action has two options, minor action, regular, disengage, two actions, full disengage, or I'm sorry, uh, minor action, disengage, single action, uh, full disengage, but, uh, cool. And again, being able to hide or dash is irrelevant in DC 20. Uh, like the fact that you can do that as a bonus action in uh, fifth edition is irrelevant here. Debilitating strike is cool. You spend an action point, a stamina point to perform a debilitating strike, make an attack against the target. It makes a physical save against your attack check. So depending on how good you roll your attack, uh, depends on what they need to roll to save. Uh, on a hit, it takes the weapon damage. And then if it fails the save until the end of your next turn, it suffers one of the following effects of your choice. Which is cool. You can make them exposed where attacks against it have advantage. Deafened where it can't hear. Hindered where it has disadvantage on attacks. Or slowed where every one space costs two, sp two spaces. So... What's cool here is, again, the customization. If you have the stamina to spend and an action to make this attack, you can do a debilitating strike. You roll your attack roll, determine whether or not that hits, and then they make a saving throw. Uh, if the save fails, then they are given one of these conditions. The interesting thing, of course, being that if it fails, then it's under a condition, which means if you hit it again, you would regain your stamina. So you can kind of self-feed debilitating strike into like a loop of gaining, uh, gaining and using your stamina. Uh, rogues also get this uh, Sinister Strike, which is kind of your sneak attack. Uh, sneak attack for each system, let's see. 5th edition is at level 1, a d6, extra damage, as long as certain parameters are met, which is you have an ally within 5 feet of the target, or you have advantage on the attack. Uh, those are the two most common ways to do sneak attack in 5th edition. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you need to hit a creature that is off guard. I believe that's usually so flat-footed. Um, flanked, um, a creature that you're hidden from, that kind of thing. Or you could feign and make them uh, flat-footed, off guard, and then get sneak attack. So you have to do certain things in order to get sneak attack. And then in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it's 1d6. And it does scale up to 2d6 at, I think, level 5. And eventually goes to 4d6. An interesting thing for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, you can apply it multiple times per turn. 5th Edition, you can only apply it once. Although, if you do get a reaction attack, you and you're meeting the conditions for sneak attack, you can apply it during that reaction attack in 5th Edition. The difference is that in 5th edition the damage scales up exponentially. Every two levels, every odd level, the rogue sneak attack goes up to cap out at 10d6, which is uh, quite a bit. So DC 20 does not use these high damage numbers, and as such, it's a plus one damage for certain conditions a plus two damage for certain conditions, a plus three damage for certain conditions, plus four, plus five. What I love about this, though, is the fact that your sneak attack scales with how impaired your target is. If your target is bleeding, flanked, or grappled, you get a plus one damage. Plus one damage in DC 20 is pretty solid. It's... Uh, Definitely comparable to getting a d6 
in the other systems. However, if they're deafened, exposed, hindered, or slowed, you get plus two to damage. If they're blinded, incapacitated, restrained, you get plus three to damage. Paralyzed, stunned, oops, paralyzed, stunned, uh, plus four damage. Surprised or unconscious, plus five damage. Now we're really talking. Plus five damage is a lot. If you can get that surprise or hit an unconscious target, that's really solid. However, the other thing that's super cool with this, besides the fact that it feels realistic that depending on how impaired your enemy is, depends on how much extra damage you deal with this sneak attack type sinister strike, you don't have to wait to level 20 to get these higher level damages. You can get that plus 5 damage at level 1 if you can surprise a target, if you can get them unconscious. Or plus four damage if they're stunned or paralyzed. Like the fact that you're not waiting to level five to get two d six, or level ten, I think it is in uh, Pathfinder Second Edition to get three d six. Like you're getting this solid like damage increases at level one if you can make these things specific conditions happen. And Plus five might not seem like a lot, but again, in a system where first level characters have anywhere usually from five at the lowest to like 12 at the most, plus five damage is huge, especially when you're considering that's plus damage. If you add in the plus two damage for the weapon, most likely that's seven. And if you heavy hit you know you could be talking eight damage nine damage on a brutal hit you probably have advantage so you might be getting that this is this is solid super cool super flavorful uh and they also get skill expertise one of the few classes that do where your uh, mastery cap increases by one uh, so that you can be adept a plus four bonus in a skill. And I can't tell you how, like, I can't fully express how solid this is, how powerful this is. I had a monk in one of my games, and he, I think he was an orc, and I think that's why he had it. But he had skill mastery adept in athletics, and, like, his bonus to grapple was... Uh, I think it was plus seven. It was nearly impossible to, like, counteract grapple checks. He was that good at it. So, uh, this kind of breaks the, the mold of normally you can't be adept in anything until level five. And being able to do it at level one is, uh, I, it's just so strong. Uh, again, spent too much time in a rogue. Uh, just a uh, quick look at these. Unseen ambush. Advantage on stealth checks made to uh, using the hide action. Uh, if you make an attack that has advantage from being unseen, you could spend a stamina point to deal an extra two damage per stamina spent. Uh, so solid. And um, I mean, if you wanted to just throw your uh, stamina into extra damage, that's really cool. And evasion is a high level rogue ability. Let's see what it does here. When an effect that you can see deals damage to you, you can spend an action point as a reaction to half the damage against you. If the trigger and effect has half damage on a miss, you take no damage. So it's pretty much the same. You have to spend a reaction. I use air quotes on reaction because you have four reactions every round. But of course, every reaction you take does limit how many actions you have on your next turn but it also highlights one of the strengths of the system and I'll mention it again here you have four action points at the end of every turn to use through your next turn and if you needed to spend your entire like four actions dodging out of the way of dragon fire I think you do it even if you don't get a, like any actions on your turn and your turn comes and it ends and you get your four actions back, I mean, hell, you just took no damage from four breath weapons from dragons. 
Whew. And that's only second level. All right. Let's uh, let's look at the next one. We've got the sorcerer. So we got another spellcaster. Uh, overload magic as a class feature. You can spend two action points in combat to channel raw magical energy for a minute or until you become incapacitated or die Choo or choose to end it early at any time for free. For the duration, your magic is overloaded and you're subject to the following effects. So I should just say up front, I have not looked at the sorcerer at all. So this is a first impressions. So let's get into it here. So you, at first you set it up, you spend two action points and then uh, for the next minute you have these effects. Plus five to all spell checks you make. Wow. Wow is that good because again, if you beat an armor class by five or more, it's a heavy hit. If you beat it by 10 or more, a brutal hit. If you're getting plus five to your spell checks, that means you're pretty much at plus nine at level one, as long as you use this overload magic ability. You are heavy hitting almost every time, maybe even brutal hitting every time for an additional one or two damage. That's, that's insane. Um, let's see. Maybe there's some kind of a drawback to it, though. So continuing on, you must immediately make an attribute save against your spell DC, your save DC upon using this feature. And again, at the start of each of your turns, on a failure, you gain exhaustion. You lose any exhaustion gained this way when you complete a short rest. Uh, okay, so, so, yeah, that's pretty serious. Uh, and of course, again, I think... The reason that it says that you could choose to end it early for free. So essentially you're spending two action points, gaining plus five to all of your spell checks, which is, it's just so crazy. I, I can't even believe that that's a thing, but it is balanced by when you use this ability, you need to make uh, a 12 on uh, on a saving throw and then at the start of each of your turns and every time you fail you're getting levels of exhaustion which work differently in DC 20 it is a minus one to everything and a minus one to speed uh, which can be very pen punishing uh, as soon as you start picking up failures with this ability you probably don't want to do it again until you take a short rest but I think it's pretty cool. It's got a really good risk reward um, ability there. Spell break. Uh, let's see what we got here. You can attempt to cast a spell without spending any mana points. Now that doesn't sound powerful. Let's see. <laughs> uh, the spell can include mana point enhancements, but the total mana point you would normally spend can exceed your mana spend limit. Compare the spell check you make to cast the spell against the spell break DC. If the spell doesn't normally require a spell check, then you must make one to perform the spell break. Spell break DC. Your save DC plus the amount of MP you would have normally spent to cast the spell. Okay, so the, the saving throw that you need to make is going to be 12 plus... The mana that you would spend, which would be uh, would be thirteen, most likely, on a success, the spell takes effect, and you take true damage equal to the amount of mana points you would normally spend. On a failure, the spell fails, has no effect, and the spell break DC increases by five until you complete a short rest. So. As you fail this, you're probably not going to be able to keep doing it. But pretty cool, pretty cool. Let's see. Uh, critical success or failure. You must roll on the wild magic table. If 
an effect forces a creature to make a save, it makes it against your DC, save DC, and it lasts until the end of your next turn. Okay, cool. So, if you ran out of mana, or for whatever reason wanted to save the mana, you could attempt to spell break, and you make a spell check versus... Uh, usually at level one it's going to be probably 13 and if you succeed you'll probably take one damage and get your spell then on a failure uh, the spell fails and it's going to be uh, harder because you're going to need an 18 to do this again until you finish a short rest but I think it's pretty cool it's very flavorful and I love the risk and reward features here on the sorcerer uh, while magic table I uh, don't really have the time to go over that too much in depth right now uh, but I would say that the wild magic table also takes effect uh, sometimes during uh, spell duels which is how you counter spell spells in DC 20 uh, level 2 I think I have to move on to the next class but just a quick you have sorcery points and meta magic very familiar probably to people who play 5th edition uh, looks the same, two sorcery points. Um, uh, sorcery points are limited just like your mana points to the amount that you could spend on a spell. <laughs> regain half sorcery points when you complete a short rest. You regain any during a long rest, so... I mean, regaining half of your sorcery points during a short rest is better than 5th edition where you only get them back on a long rest or if you convert your spell slots into uh, sorcery points. And uh, so that's cool. I applaud that. Uh, you gain an additional three sorcery points each time you gain a sorcerer class feature. You can only benefit once per level up to a maximum of eight sorcery points. Okay, all right. Uh, and you gain two of the following meta magics. A lot of these names seem similar. Careful spell, distant spell, extend spell, heightened spell, quicken spell, subtle spell, transmuted spell, twin spell. I gotta move on to the next class. So I think we have three more to get through. We have the warlock. Uh, Warlock seems uh, pretty cool, very flavorful. Uh, they are a spellcaster. What makes a Warlock interesting in uh, DC 20? Well, I think the first thing is got to be Life Tap. Um, I've read into the Warlock a little bit, but this is still going to be kind of a, a first look for me too. But you gain the ability to sacrifice your health to enhance your power. You can spend an amount of hit points up to your prime modifier to enhance your spells in the following ways. So prime modifier, that's going to be three at level one. And uh, you could spend up to three mana to do these enhancements, uh, HP enhancements. When using mana enhancements, you can spend one hit point in place of a mana point. When you do the total hit point and mana point spent can't exceed your mana spend limit. So normally spellcasters need to spend mana to enhance their spells. Warlocks can actually just spend their hit points instead and save their mana points for other spells. So it just gives them more flexibility in how they cast their spells. Uh, blood damage. When you make an attack you can spend a hit point to increase the damage by one. Um, one for one. Uh, not 100% on this one being good or not, but if that one damage is what you needed to knock the target out, um, it could be worth it. I do see a downside to this, though. You, When you make an attack, so it's before you actually hit, you can spend one hit point to increase the damage by one. Um, I probably would not do this one, actually. Unless I'm missing something, if I am, let me know in the comments. Uh, let's see. Blood healing. When you produce an effect that restores hit points, you can spend one hit point to increase the hit point restored by one. So, essentially, you're giving one of your hit points to an ally. 
you know, if you have the extra hit points and you need to spread it around, uh, it could be good. It could could be good. Let's see. Hasty bargain. When you make an attack check or a spell check, spend a hit point to gain advantage on the check. So, normally you would have to spend an extra action to gain advantage on this attack or check. The cool thing here is that the Warlock can spend their hit points to get it. So, you could make an attack. You could make an attack and spend a hit point to give yourself advantage. You could... I'm not saying that this is worth it, but if you wanted to make a third straight attack, you could spend two hit points and a third action. At some point, it's not worth, it's definitely not worth doing, but I could see spending one hit point to give yourself advantage on a thing if you needed all of your other actions for other things. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Pack Boon is going to give you uh, one of these choices. Packed Weapon, this is, I believe, similar to Packed to the Blade for 5th edition. You choose a weapon in your possession and bond with it, making it your packed weapon. Yeah, you can only have one packed weapon at a time. If the weapon has the ammo property, it manifests its own ammo when you load it. You gain the following benefits while wielding the weapon. You're considered to have mastery with your packed weapon. So, uh, Warlocks, uh, let's see. Um, right. Combat Mastery, they have light weapons, light armor, and spellcasting. But if you choose, sorry for all the scrolling, but if you choose packed weapon, you would be able to use a heavy weapon here. So cool, very cool. Maneuvers, you gain access to attack maneuvers and learn two additional save maneuvers of your choice. Additionally, you're able to use the weapons maneuver of your packed weapon. So again, being a spellcaster normally does not get maneuvers. Here you're gonna get some maneuvers, uh, so pretty cool. Uh, and you get the uh, Weapon style passive for your uh, packed weapon. Again, spellcasters typically don't get weapon style passives, but you will. And you have a pocket dimension that you can dismiss the weapon into and then uh, summon it back. Very similar. And you can bond with a new packed weapon during a quick rest, which is 10 minutes, I believe. Uh, so the game DC20 uses a uh, quick rest of like, I think it's 10 minutes and then short rest, which is an hour, just like in fifth edition. And then long rest, which is eight hours split into two, four hour chunks and then a full rest, which is uh, 24 hours. So looking at the next option, we have packed armor. You make an armor in your possession and bond with it, making it your packed armor. You can only have one packed armor at a time and gain the following benefits. You're considered to have mastery with the packed armor. So normally, warlocks only have light armor mastery. Here, you're gonna get heavy armor if you want it. Uh, access to all defensive maneuvers. Again, warlocks not normally getting maneuvers. You're gonna get defensive maneuvers here. Uh, plus one mental defense and plus one mental defense resistance. This is pretty pretty good because mental defense resistance is pretty rare and your mental defense is usually lower unless spellcasters might have higher, monks would have higher, but this is gonna give you an even bigger edge getting this plus one. Uh, again, just like the weapon pocket dimension uh, you can put it into a pocket dimension and then uh, summon it. And over a quick rest, uh, 10 minute, you can uh, bond with a new armor. So we got packed cantrip. Uh, choose a spell you know with the cantrip tag. The chosen spell becomes your packed cantrip. When you cast it, it gains the following benefits. So this is going to be like that person in 5th edition who has all the Eldritch Blast enhancements, 
The really cool thing here though that I'm excited about is this isn't just for Eldritch Blast. The Warlocks in this system are not just Eldritch Blast, Eldritch Blast, Eldritch Blast, Eldritch Blast. Customize whatever cantrip you want to be your special cantrip. And I just love that flexibility. So, you can have this spell deal uh, plus one damage to bloody to or bleeding targets. Cool. Uh, the spells, tar spells range is touch. It becomes three spaces. Otherwise, it increases by five spaces. So, um, pretty cool that you're able to improve the spell that way. And you can spend an action point to force the target to make a physical save. Uh, if the spell doesn't require a spell check, you must make one before this action. And on a failure, the target begins bleeding. So, you can essentially spend an extra action if you hit with this. You give them the bleeding condition. And then the next time you hit them with it, if they weren't already bleeding, uh, they will take the extra damage. However, the other thing that I have to point out that I missed before, it's not just bleeding, but bloodied. So uh, DC 20 uses something that I think a lot of people have carried over from 4th edition, but it's actually not a 5th edition or a Pathfinder term, and that's bloodied. And bloodied is at half hit points. So if the target of your packed cantrip is at half hit points and they're bloodied, then they will take an extra point of damage from this uh, packed cantrip. When you complete a long rest, you can choose a different spell. Uh, so again, pretty cool. You can only have one packed cantrip at a time, but it, like every day you can uh, pick a different cantrip that you want to make your special packed cantrip. And uh, it's just... Super cool. And Pact Familiar. You can cast a Find Familiar spell without spending mana points. When you cast the spell, the Familiar automatically gains the Familiar Attack and Friendly Fire Familiar Traits. Uh, so I guess it's kind of like Pact to the Chain. Um, and this is a flavor feature. I haven't really like talked about flavor features, but I think this one is really cool. Because uh, Beseech Patron... During a long rest, while sleeping or meditating, you can access an inner sanctum within your mind. Its appearance is influenced by your psyche and subject to change. While inside your inner sanctum, you can attempt to contact your patron. If they choose to respond, they enter your mind, and you might possibly be able to see or hear them. While connected to your patron in this way, they are aware of your surroundings, but you can't take actions or move. Your patron chooses when to end this connection. Uh, or you can make a mental save against your own DC to try to force the connection to end. Um, super cool, super flavorful. Uh, really good way for the DM to impart uh, story beats or plot hooks. Or really, this is missing from the 5th edition Warlock, I think, in my opinion. And it's just really cool. Granted that a DM in 5th edition could use an ability like this because it is more of a flavor feature, but cool that it's actually spelled out there. Um, I know I keep saying this, I don't want to spend too much time on the level 2 class features. Uh, let's just look at them quick. Life Drain. You can use the wounds of your enemies to heal yourself. You gain the following benefits. When you... Deal damage to a bloody creature, you can spend a rest point as a reaction to regain two hit points. So, cool. Um, essentially, if you hit a creature that's at half hit points, you can spend one of your rest points to regain two hit points. Normally, that would happen during a short rest or a quick rest. And here, you're able to do it within combat, so pretty cool. Uh, but another key point of the system to point out is reaction. You can spend it uh, as a reaction. So it is a reaction, but it actually doesn't cost any action. So normally your reactions would cost you actions, but this just goes to show that when I say you have an unlimited number of reactions, as long as you have the actions to fuel them, you really have an unlimited number of reactions if you have free actions like this that would allow you to... 
uh, do things. Now, of course, this is probably uh, coming from an action where you used an action to hit a bloodied creature, to deal damage to a bloodied creature. But if there was a way, I don't know 100% if, like, let's say a spell like Armor of Agathis were in here, where if they hit you, they take damage. That might be a way where, without spending an action, you could use a reaction at no cost to regain two hit points. Of course, it is a limited resource. You only have a number of rest points equal to your level. So, yeah, it is uh, a scarce resource. Uh, essentially, DC-20 is uh, equivalent of 5th edition's hit dice. When a creature dies within five spaces of you, you could spend an action point as a reaction to regain a rest point, provided the creature's maximum hit points is five or higher. Wow. Okay. So you remember I said how limited of a resource the rest points were, but this, this is so cool because I love the Phantom Rogue in 5th edition, and this screams of, like, Tokens of the Departed. A creature dies within 25 feet of you, and you just spend an action as a reaction and regain one of your, essentially, your hit dice. But then, when you hit a bloodied creature, you can spend the rest point to heal yourself, and you could just keep cycling through this. My only fear with this would be the typical uh, bag of rats trick where you have a bag of rats and you need to uh, you know regain your rest point so you kill a rat and use an action point to regain a rest point like you do run into that like abusability but I think it's really cool uh, you could spend one or more rest points while resting to regain a mana Uh, so that's cool. You don't regain hit points, but normally you don't regain mana points like this, so that's uh, pretty cool. Alright, we got two more to get through. We got the Warlord, is a Marshal. They get stamina. Let's take a look at the Warlord. I have had a Warlord in almost every single game of DC20 that I've run. In fact, it's possible that it's every game of DC20 that I've run. Possibly. Anyway, the uh, Warlord regains a stamina every time they gain a creature a health die. So Warlords uh, are like the 4th edition Warlords. They're actually changing the class, the name to, I think it's Commander. But what's really cool here is Warlords want to help. They want to be that like Commander, that like stri uh, strategist... Um, the strategic person. So, you want to grant help dice, and when you do, you regain your stamina. Very cool. Uh, we have Inspiring Presence. When you spend stamina while in combat, you can restore an amount of hit points equal to the stamina spent. Uh, creatures within five spaces either can hear, see you, and you can divide the hit points among them. So, at level one, it's only going to be one hit point, but you should be pretty constantly spending stamina, gaining stamina, and then using that to heal one hit point to your allies uh, almost constantly. So, uh, very cool. Uh, Commander's Call, super cool ability. Uh, you can spend an action point, a stamina point, to command a creature that you could see within five feet of you. Uh, the chosen creature can immediately take one of the following actions as a reaction for free. So, no cost to them. You're essentially spending your action point and your stamina, and you can have them make an attack with advantage. You can have them take full dodge. You can have them move up to their speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Uh, very cool. Uh, I didn't... I didn't really look at the level 2 features for uh, any of the classes for the most part, and that's true with the Warlord as well. I do have to get through the Wizard, and I'm kind of running long here. Uh, let's just take a quick look at this. 
Uh, combat leader, whenever you roll for initiative, you can immediately grant a creature of your choice a D8 help die, which they can add to their initiative check. So, I mean, that's just a free D8 to one of your allies every time uh, you roll initiative. Pretty cool. Uh, Heraldic banner. I love banners, so this is super cool, too. Uh, flavorful as hell. The banner uh, bears the emblem of your group, guild, faction. Make it look like whatever you want. Spend an action point to plant or pick up the banner. Uh, you can display the banner by carrying it. Uh, let's see. The banner is not considered on display while it's lying on the ground in the possession of an enemy. While your banner is on display, it has an aura that extends five spaces, so 25 feet in each direction. While your banner is on display, you can take banner actions. Let's see what we got here. Uh, bolster. You can spend one action point to grant creatures of your choice a temporary hit point. Cool. Uh, rally. You can spend one action point to take the help action to aid a creature of your choice with an attack. Additionally, you can do so as a reaction. Uh, so this is kind of making... Uh, the range is more limited than the bard, but kind of giving you bard-like abilities, so pretty cool. Uh, reinforce. When a creature makes a save, you can spend an action point as a reaction to grant it advantage on the save. So the banner kind of makes you uh, bard-like. Uh, and then we come to the wizard. Last, but hopefully not least. I have not looked at the wizard at all, so this will be a first look for me as well. First impressions. It is a spellcaster. It has no stamina. First wizard ability. Mana limit break. When you spend mana points, you can increase your mana spend limit by one. You can use this feature once per long rest, but you regain the ability to use it when you roll initiative. So, normally, you can only spend mana up to your combat mastery uh, per spell or ability. The wizard is breaking that to where you can spend two once per long rest, but every time you roll initiative you get it back. So very cool uh, in that it is a once per day, but also once per encounter. And in actuality, I'm not sure why it's not just when you roll for initiative, like a once per day. I mean, once per encounter, but it's very, very good ability. It allows you to enhance spells in ways that other casters can't. Uh, typical wizard in that regard. The arcane sigil is really cool. I did look at this ahead of time. You can spend an action point and a mana point to create a one space diameter arcane sigil on the ground uh, beneath you that lasts for a minute. It's kind of like the Druid Grove, except it's um, beneath you. You choose a spell school. You've got protection, enchantment, necromancy, or a spell tag like fire, cold, teleportation. When you create the sigil, uh, the sigil radiates the magic of the chosen type. While a creature is within the area of your arcane sigil, sigil, it has advantage on spell checks to cast or produce the effects of spells of the chosen school. So it is a hefty cost in that you have to spend a mana point to do this and an action. But if you were in a f situation where you knew you were going to be casting specific kinds of spells, this is so strong because you're going to have advantage on the spell checks to cast those spells. Although stacking disadvantage is going to uh, tick that down to where you'll have advantage on the first check, then a regular attempt, and then you could spend your third and fourth actions to make another normal attempt. Uh, but still uh, pretty good. And... Yeah, still pretty cool. Uh, and flavorful that a wizard could do this, could put down a sigil and uh, have that uh, extra ability. 
So we get a spell book, which is a flavor feature. Inscribing spells is pretty much what you would expect. Uh, let's see, level two. Uh, again, don't want to spend too much time on level two arcane points. Uh, you can use your arcane sigil feature. You can spend one or more arcane points to add. Okay, so you can empower the sigil when you put it down. And while you're within the arcane sigil, you can spend arcane points on spell enhancements for spells that include your... Okay. So instead of spending your mana points, you can spend your arcane points while you're within your arcane sigil. Right, you can't exceed your mana spend limit unless you mana limit break. You regain half on a short rest and all during a long rest. And like the sorcerer sorcery points, uh, you gain three additional when you gain a wizard class feature. Uh, so where the sorcerer has sorcery points, the wizard gets arcane points. Um, let's see, just real quick, the inscribing spells, uh, how that works in comparison to 5th edition. Inscribing a spell in your spellbook requires five gold in an hour of work per mana point required to cast it um, at its base mana point cost. This effort can coincide with the rest. Gold covers materials. Uh, okay, so this is much cheaper um, and I think it's quicker. For 5th edition, I believe it's uh, 50 gold per spell level and uh, Two hours. Uh, I believe it's two hours. In fact, um, just quick look at the wizard and see rather than me guessing. Uh, let's see. Copying a spell in your spell book for each spell level, two hours. So I was right about that, and 50 gold pieces. So I was right about that. So you're getting it for one hour of work and uh, five gold. So a much better cost, although I don't have like an item list to know what the actual suggested economy in the game is. So five gold might be a lot, maybe it's okay. Um, I assume that that's not a bad cost because Five gold doesn't seem like a lot, but anyway, that concludes this short rest, part two. It is a little long, uh, longer than the first part, but hopefully you made it this long. Hopefully I've piqued your interest in DC 20. Again, top of the page, DC 20 is created by the Dungeon Coach at thedungeoncoach.com. The Alpha 0.6.1 just came out. If you want, you can get that for uh, $10, uh, $5 if you take the coupon offer uh, when you go to the website. And the Kickstarter, which should come with the beta, is uh, launching uh, beginning of June. I believe it's the 4th, but beginning of June, look for that. Uh, otherwise, hopefully... Uh, you could find a game of DC 20. It to me is the perfect blend of fifth edition and Pathfinder second edition. It's my preferred game at this point, my preferred system, and I'm just so excited for it. So anyway, have a great rest of your day, night, wherever you are, and I'll catch you on the next short rest. Bye for now. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the content that you just saw, consider joining one of our games at startplaying.gaming forward slash roll with us DMs.